years ago, I was in a doctor's office waiting to see a doctor, which is what you do when you're waiting in a doctor's office. Minding my own business, and then I saw this magazine lying there that caught my attention, so I picked it up and I read it. And it had on the cover, one of the articles said, what do you see when you stand in front of the mirror without any clothes on? Like I knew right then I should have put it down, but I was intrigued. And so it went on, the subtitle said, how to train for your body type. Whether you're an ectomorph or an endomorph or a mes mesomorph, you can outsmart, outsmart your genes. And um, this is a, a notion that was made popular by American psychologist William Sheldon back in the 1940s. He's, he's the one that came up with these three basic body types. And you may, you may have heard these, an ectomorph. Uh, would be a lean, strong, um, or, or lean and long with difficult building muscles, just a very skinny, thin person. An endomorph would be somebody with, who's big, with high body fat, often pear-shaped, with a high tendency to store body fat. And then there's my type, the mesomorph, with it, which is muscular and well-built, with a high metabolism... You guys are being kind of mean to me today, but anyway. <laughs> of course, there are combinations of all of those, but I, I clearly have my entire life been in the endomorph camp, or, or rather the, yeah, the endomorph camp. And I used to, I used to like be defensive about that, but I, but I, sir, I, I saw a t-shirt once that I liked. It, I thought it was a good one uh, that, that says this. Go put that up there. I am in shape. Round is a shape. So yeah, I'm in shape. So anyway, that's really a lame way of kind of saying that. Interestingly, the, 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 the Bible says over and over that we as the church, we are often called and referred to as the body of Christ. Over and over in scripture, the church is referred to uh, in, in this way and, and how we're connected to one another as different body parts, so to speak, as we serve Christ who is the head of our body. Ephesians 4 says, From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And just as there are different types of physical bodies, there are different types and sort of different forms and expressions of church bodies. And so we're in this series called This Is Us, and we're just talking about some things that, that mark us as a church, who we are, what we believe, what we do, and we've looked at several things so far. Um, but today I want to talk about what kind of church are we? Like, where, where did we come from? And I speak not only of this local church, but our, our fellowship of churches. And, um, and so I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about history stuff. And I know some of you, history is not your bag. But I do think it's really, really important that we know as a church family, and you know uh, if you're visiting or if you're kind of thinking about becoming a part of our family, I want you to know where we come from. Because we have, we have a really, really interesting and I think a good history behind our fellowship of churches. Um, just real quickly, um, I did not personally grow up in the churches of Christ. I uh, attended an American Baptist church when I was a kid. But when I really gave my life to the Lord and felt like that it would please God for me to go into ministry, I just wasn't sure what kind of church that I was supposed to minister in. I, I didn't really want to minister in an American Baptist church denomination. And really, I didn't want to really be a part of any denomination. I wanted just to be a Christian minister and go by just what the Bible says. So I investigated and studied all different types of churches. Um, I had some friends who were involved in the Church of Christ near where I grew up. I began studying about the Churches of Christ, and I really, really liked what I read. And so I decided this is the group that most sort of resembles where I'm at and where I want to be as a Christian and as a minister. And the only reason I tell you this is because because I did not grow up in the Churches of Christ. I feel like I can be be a little bit more um, unbiased about the weaknesses and the strengths of our churches. And I'm going to talk about both of those this morning. And so while our churches are far from perfect, I believe with all my heart that we really have the best of both worlds, that we are simply trying to be New Testament churches, and yet we have 
we have the ability to work together in many, many different ways. And so throughout the world, in fact, God is blessing our churches as we do our part to add to the kingdom of God and the number of people that we'll see in heaven as, as Jay was speaking about. So, so what kind of church body is this? I'm going to give you a sort of three or four different things that kind of typify the type of church this is. And the first thing I would say is that we are a connected church without being a denominational church. We have the sort of best of both worlds. So our particular church, First Church of Christ, is part of a larger fellowship of churches throughout the United States and throughout the world that, that, uh, uh, that, um, that uh, is a little bit confusing, but our fellowship goes by a couple different names. So the official name is, is, is the Independent Christian Churches and Churches of Christ. Independent Christian Churches. I want you to say that real fast with me. Independent Churches. I can't even say it, right? So that's a mouthful. That's a mouthful. Well, why is, why is it that called? It's very confusing. The overwhelming majority of the churches in our fellowship, especially the ones that are kind of tend to be the, the most growing ones, they go by Christian church. Almost all of our churches these days go by the name Christian Church. And I like that because you don't see too many other churches that are so-and-so Christian Church, right? Uh, up here in the upper Midwest, many are called Churches of Christ for various reasons I could get into. Um, but your eyes would glaze over as I talk more history, like kind of like they are right now. But, but there are a few of our churches that have, have a different name. We have churches in our fellowship called Christ Church of the Valley or Christ Church at Georgetown or, or Indian Creek Tr Christian Church, which simply goes by the creek. Uh, I attended, was baptized in a church called Colony Heights Church of Christ. But the majority and the most well-known of our churches throughout the country are, are called Christian churches, independent Christian churches and churches of Christ. Now that is, that is a mouthful. And it does cause some confusion when, I'm, when, when people ask, well, what kind of church are you? It's kind of confusing to tell people because they'll have different questions. Well, are, are you the same as the Church of Christ on 21? Or are you the, the same as the Church of Christ downtown? And people assume because they have the name Church of Christ that we're of the same fellowship and we are and we're not. Um, and, and so it's kind of difficult sometimes to have people understand that we are a different church. Now, the Owasso Church of Christ, which is down 52, um, they are actually a part of our church fellowship as well. They're a sister church, but it's kind of confusing. And that's why so many churches in our fellowship have begun, uh, just gone to the name of Christian Church, to be more clearly identified with, with our larger group of churches. And, um, and so this is something that we've actually talked about at our church various times. But right now, we're First Church of Christ. So, independent Christian churches and churches of Christ. To make matters more confusing, we also have sort of another name that we're often identified by, and mostly by church historians, and they would refer to us as the Restoration Movement. The Restoration Movement. Because our churches came about as a result of just, here's a crazy concept, let's just, let's just try to restore New Testament Christianity. Let's do away with denominational labels and man-made rules. Let's not be Presbyterian or Catholic or Methodist or whatever it is. Let's just be Christians. Now that's really what first attracted me um, to, the, to our church fellowship. Again, I looked into all kinds of denominations, but I just, I just liked being called Christians. Uh, by the way, I don't know if you picked one of these up last week, but we did put uh, some of these out there. This is just something that was put out several years ago, which has just some more information about our fellowship of churches. And you'll notice the cover says simply Christians. That's, that's all we want to do. We want to be just simply Christians. So as, as a church fellowship, the independent Christian churches and churches of Christ... We have roots that go way back to the, the early American frontier in the 1800s. There was a father and a son, Thomas and Alexander Campbell. Now, they were ministers of the Presbyterian Church in Scotland. But eventually, at different times, they each came over to the United States. And even though they really didn't talk to one another about this, they were coming to the same sort of conviction that, that we, why are we, why are we, 
Presbyterians. Let's just be Christians. And so they kind of had the same idea that let's just go by Christian church. And so Thomas and Alexander Campbell, they eventually kind of reunited. And they were surprised that each one was thinking the same thing. And so they started, kind of in a sense, they started the Christian churches. And their plea was simply, again, to restore New Testament Christianity. They broke away from the Presbyterian church and and all the denominational baggage, the man-made rules. Now, there were also other leaders on the American frontier at that time seeking to restore New Testament Christianity. And a lot of them kind of joined together. And so, so we have sort of several co-founders of our churches. But, but again, that was the goal to just, let's just be Christians. And, and that, that simple message of, of New Testament Christianity really spread like wildfire in the early American frontier. So again, we have sort of the best of both worlds. We're a, we're a connected church. We're rooted in a, in a great tradition of let's just go by the Bible. Not that we're... Not that we're perfect at that, but that is our goal. But we also are connected to a larger fellowship of people. We're not just some sort of lone ranger church out there doing our own thing. We are part of a larger body of believers. We have a rich history. We have theological and doctrinal integrity. We have, we have, we have deep roots. Our churches as a group, we go together to, to do all kinds of things. Several colleges and seminaries and countless missionaries and mission agencies and church planning organizations and campus ministries and all kinds of things we all have and we, 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 we coordinate to, to support them without having a denominational headquarters telling us that we need to send them a certain amount of money if we want to stay in the domination or telling us, okay, now we, we have decided denominational headquarters that you have to believe X, Y, Z. Like, we don't have that. We're independent. We do a lot of things together, but we're connected as, as a church family. Now, I think that's really important because, as I said, I do not think it's, it's a good thing that, we, that a church doesn't have have a history and have a connection with other, with other people. We have connection, we have partnership with other parts of the body of Christ, but again, we don't have that denominational baggage. And I believe that that message of let's just do what the New Testament says, let's structure ourselves like the New Testament says, the first church, kind of like we talked about last week, I think that that is what really people are looking for. At least I know this, I know about 110, 115 years ago, that's what people were looking for. As far as our local church, in the First Church of Christ here in Owasso, um, it was formed in Owasso, again, a simple plea to let's just, let's just do what the Bible says to do. Let's be how the Bible says to be. And so the Church of Christ in Owasso here was formed um, over 100 years ago, 110 years ago, whatever it is, and grew and grew and grew. Um, most of you know it was located for many years at the corner of, of Oliver and Hickory and, um, and just grew and grew and grew and grew until it, it just couldn't grow anymore. And so at that time in the mid-60s, the church did something which is, which is almost near impossible to do, honestly. They relocated a congregation from that cramped space to this place here. And untold amounts of work and sacrifice and prayer and it's just amazing what they did so that you and I can sit here in this place so that we can preach the gospel of Christ so that others can come to faith in Christ so that we can fulfill our mission. But again, the history of this local church goes back over 100, 100 years, 110, 115 years, something like that. Now, I was not the minister when the church started 100 years ago. Some of you may be wondering about that. I was not. It's like, Chris, quit with the lame jokes, right? Um, the other thing is we are a scriptural church. Let's just, let's just be a New Testament church. What does the Bible say? But we're also not legalistic. And, and, and we talked about a couple weeks ago how the, the Word of God, the Bible, is, is infallible. It's, it's the Word of God. And so we believe as such. And so because of that, we want to be a scriptural church. I think that's what, that's what people are looking for. What, what does the Bible say? Now, we're not perfect. 
There are many, many years uh, among our, some of our churches, and even probably lingers to this day, where, where um, Christian church people were sort of were arrogant and critical of other believers and, and other churches. And there were even some people in our fellowship of churches that thought, we're the only Christians. We're the only ones who are saved. And it's just wrong, and while we really believe in how we do things and what we believe, that we're not going to be legalistic and judgmental like that. So from the beginning of our churches, we've had kind of a couple slogans that I think are, are, very, um, are very good, and we still need to maintain this spirit. One of the slogans was that we are not the only Christians, but we're Christians only. We're not the only Christians, but we're Christians only. In other words, we, we don't judge others or believe, or believe we're the only church, but we just do what we think the Bible says that we ought to do. Another slogan would be, where the Bible speaks, we speak. Where the Bible is silent, we are silent. Again, we operate by the word of God alone. The Bible properly understood is clear on, on many, many things. But there are some things, especially in the modern world, where the Bible doesn't really speak directly to that. So we leave room for differences of opinions and certain things. But again, our goal, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? Not the tradition of men, not the denominational headquarters or, or whatever, but what does the Bible stay, say? And that's why, that's why our churches were started way back in the 1800s on the American frontier by a couple of Scottish Presbyterian ministers. But traditions are important. I love that great line from Fiddler on the Roof. Debbie says, traditions, traditions. Without our traditions, we would be as shaky, shaky as a fiddler on the roof. And I think that's, that's true in many ways. Traditions are good and grounding. But sometimes people sort of are more concerned about keeping traditions in the church rather than and, and li, or making them go to the level of, of Scripture. Um, somebody said, I love this, tradition is important, but traditionalism is deadly. Tradition is the living faith of the dead, but traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. So we want to maintain what we believe the Bible says and Scripture says, but also to recognize that we're not the only part of, of the body of Christ, that there are church bodies that come in many, many different styles and, and they look differently. But we're going to maintain our stance on the clear teaching of Scripture. It also allows for the fact that we're not the only Christians. And so we strive to be a scriptural church, but we don't want to be legalistic. Another thing about our, our fellowship of churches is that we, we all have the same mission. Like we're here because of the Great Commission where Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. That, that is our, our mission as a church. But you'll find that a lot of our churches kind of look different. We have the same mission, but we have different sort of methods of doing that. And our churches, our missionary agencies are incredible, incredibly united in this mission. But there are a lot of things that are a little bit different as you go among our different churches. For example, I went to school, lived for eight years in the hills of East Tennessee. And I can tell you that how the Christian churches do church there is a lot different than how we do church here. You can go to, to, to 26,000 member mega church, Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky, and that's going to look a lot different than the church, our churches in the hills of Jamaica or Haiti or Panama. Uh, there's going to be a lot of differences because there's different contexts, but I'll tell you, there are a couple things that will always be the same no matter where our churches are and which one you go to, is that we're always going to be only Christians. Simply, let's do what the New Testament says to do. Every church is going to have communion every single week. We've talked about this a couple weeks ago. Every one of our churches is going to have communion because that's, that's the reminder of why we do what we do in the first place. And our churches are always going to have baptism by immersion. Um, so those things will never change, but we do have the ability to contextualize how we do church to our location. Um, and that is very, very, very important. The other thing that you'll see in all of our churches, or at least most of them, unless they're brand new maybe, will be that, that our churches are, are 
autonomous. We, we conduct our own affairs. Again, we don't have a denominational headquarters saying, okay, you know, you got to do this or believe this, or now we're going to move your minister from here to here, and we're going to bring in this guy. And we each, we operate our own affairs. And so that means that, that our, our churches are led by what we call a plurality of elders. We have elders in our church. Um, and this is really important that, that this is not like my church, right? Like I don't make all the decisions or really very many of the decisions, but, but we have a team of people who lead, who lead this church. And that is much better, much more biblical, much safer. Again, even though I'm the senior pastor, it's not my church. Although we, we did have a credit card once that evidently they... They couldn't put enough letters on the card, so it said First Church of Chris. Like, I, I thought that was my own credit card that has, like, my name on it, right? If you ever go to a church, and again, you know, we're not being legalistic, but I'm just sharing with you my heart that I've been in some churches where, like, on the wall, they've had sort of a, an organization chart of their church, and up at the very top, you know, they'll have the senior pastor, and then under him will be all these other people, and uh, maybe Jesus will be up there too, but it's a senior pastor who's at the top. And that's just not really good for a lot of reasons. It's not healthy. It's not biblical. There needs to be a group of, of individuals, of men responsible for leading the church. And say, well, why do we do that? Why do we have elders together collectively lead our church? And the question is, number one, because it's biblical, but again, also because it makes for a healthier church. And so I want to talk just real quickly about why, why do we do that? How, do, how is the church structured in the, in the first church in the book of Acts? Well, as we saw a week or so ago, the very first church, the, the leadership was basically the apostles. Jesus had spent three years training these 12 individuals, these 12 men, getting them ready for the day on the day of Pentecost when the church would, would launch. Jesus has been resurrected. He's ascended into heaven. And now it's time for the church to begin. And the apostles were basically the leaders of the first church. And in particular, Peter. Peter was the main apostle being, having been given that charge by Jesus. That Peter, you are, you're, you are the rock. I'm going to build my church on you. So Peter was kind of the sort of the main leader at the time. But it was really all of the apostles. Now, even though you might hear a lot of people today in various churches being called apostles, like whatever they want to call themselves, whatever, but biblically, there were only, there were only so many apostles. And uh, to be an apostle, biblically, a person had to have been made one by Jesus himself, seen him, spent time with him. There had to be a proximity to Jesus. So obviously, that couldn't continue very long after Jesus was gone from the earth. And so, and so the apostles were a select group of people that, that, that the age has gone away. There are no more, there are no more apostles. So for example, um, we know that Judas, one of the apostles, hanged himself. And so one day they got together and they said, we need to, we need to find a 12th apostle to replace Judas. And, and so in Acts chapter 1, it, it tells us it's necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole, listen, the whole time the Lord was living among us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And so this person had to have been with them for quite a while when Jesus was, was with them. And so they nominated two people and they prayed and they, they cast lots, which was a common way of making decisions back then. And um, that lot fell to a guy named Matthias. And so he became um, a, an apostle the only other apostle was the apostle Paul. And he was made an apostle by Jesus himself. Remember when, when, when Paul, Paul is persecuting Christians and he's on the road to, go to Damascus to go persecute some Christians. And Jesus appeared to him and said, said why, are you, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? And he made Paul an apostle. So, so, so that, is, that is the apostles. In the very beginning, the apostles led the churches. Well, the next step in the stage of leadership in the first church we see in the book of Acts came about after the churches had been started in different places. 
The apostles themselves could not lead every church, and so they had to train a, a, a group of, of people who were not apostles, but who would take over the leadership of all these churches that were around. So the Bible calls these men who are to lead the local churches elders. Elder is simply a word in the Greek. It, it's the word presbyteros. It means shepherd. It means overseer. But that the church is to be led by a group of elders. So again, at first the apostles trained and appointed elders in the church. Um, Paul stayed in Ephesus for about two and a half years teaching. And he did that while training elders to take over that church for the time when he left. In fact, in Acts 20, 17, it it says from, from Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church and he went on to give them some parting instructions as he would be leaving them soon. But eventually, even the apostles themselves couldn't train and appoint elders in all the churches. And so the church had a few more growing pains and had to make some adjustments. And so they, then they trained other younger believers to lead the church and train up and appoint elders. For example, Paul writes this to Titus in, in Titus 1.5. The reason I left you in Crete was that so you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town. So before there were elders, he considered the church unfinished. But I left you in Crete so that you may finish what I started, but I wasn't able to get elders trained in that church. And so it's very clear that in the early church, the elders... Were, were trained, were chosen, were appointed by the spiritual leaders of the church of that day. In fact, Acts 14, 23 says, Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. So in scripture, the early church and the churches were led by, by men called elders, and they were appointed by the apostles or those who, who were appointed to appoint them and trained by them. And the, the whole point being that this is how they did it in the New Testament. So in our church, striving to follow that as best we can, our local church is ultimately that the highest authority um, is, is, our, is our group of elders. And so I, I want you to know that because it's important that we understand that this is what the scripture says to do. So what are we going to try to do? We're going to try to have elders. And we're going to make sure that, that the church is led by multiple people, not just one person. And um, it's much more biblical and safer that way as, as a church. Now the Bible, the New Testament, has a lot to say about, well, what kind of, what kind of people ought to be elders? And so it has this list of, of, of the requirements of biblical elders, and you can read those in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. I'm not going to go through each of them. But the thing you'll notice is that as you look at, at these character attributes, or you look at these things, they're mostly character issues. They're mostly character issues. What kind of, what kind of men are these going to be? And, um, and so the, it also talks about what are the responsibilities of biblical elders. Um, and so, again, the, the, the word elder just means shepherd or overseer. And one of the jobs of elders is that the men ought to be able to teach and preach. 1 Timothy 3.2 says an elder should be able to teach. The elders who direct the affairs of the church are well, well are worthy of double honor especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. So in the, in the New Testament, in the first church, there was really no distinct, distinguish between, distinct, distinguish, what's the word I'm looking for? Distinction. Distinction. You guys are listening. That was, I was testing you. I really knew what the word was. And uh, there's no distinction between elders who, um, who uh, are, are, are basically, that is what their job is. And they're supported by the churches to preach and teach. But those are the same as elders who are not paid to do that. But they're the, but they're the same group of people. And the Bible calls these, calls these people elders. And so it's important that we understand that they're to teach and preach. And, um, and again, Paul says that a person whose work, primary work is preaching and teaching, worthy of double honor, simply a way of saying that there is a place for a paid minister elder in the, in the New Testament. And so that's why, we are, that's why we do that, because again, it's in the Bible. 
One of the most important things it says is that they ought to direct the affairs of the church. So here again, this is where the, the eldership as a group direct the affairs of the church. Um, 1 Timothy 5.17 says that, that they are the overseers. Again, the church is led and overseen not by one preacher or not by one person who has all the money. I've been in churches like that. It's very unhealthy, but it's a group of men, a group of people who will lead the church well. And we have been very, very blessed in our church for many, many years to have, uh, to have a great, great men, great elders. Um, we're down in numbers a little bit among the elders. This is kind of concerning to us. We really, really need uh, more men to be interested in what, is it, what does it mean to be a, an elder. And, and maybe that's something that I could do because we are in great need of, of people to step up and to do that. And so, um, but, we, but we've been very blessed in this church for many, many, many years, um, going even way back before, before me. Um, so, so they direct the affairs of the church. They, they guard the church from error. This is one of the main jobs. In fact, in Acts 20, um, Paul, Paul gets the, the elders together and he says, you need to, don't quit preaching the gospel that I left to you. There are going to be people, after I leave, people are going to come in and try to get you to believe other things. Like, don't believe them. You need to guard, guard the church from error. Make sure that you stay, you stay with the scriptures. You, you stay with what we've taught you, with what we've passed on to you. And so they, the elders are to guard the church from error. Also, the elders are to model the faithful, mature Christian life. To be, to be the examples, not, not to be perfect. Like you read through that list of requirements for elders in 1 Timothy, and you'll see all kinds, of like who can live up to that? Well, nobody can perfectly, but elders ought to be ones who are, who are quite above, uh, above the notch in that and trying to do so. Um, but the elders are to model the faithful Christian life. For me, anyway... As a pastor, especially one of the most sobering verses, I think for all, all the elders also is one, is 1 Timothy 4.16. Paul writes to young Timothy and in turn to leaders in the church, watch your life and your doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Watch your life. Watch how you're living Watch how you're, how you're conducting your life. Watch your lifestyle, but also watch your doctrine closely. Because, because if you don't, it's going to be harmful to people in their faith. And I want to tell you, and Satan, Satan has been very busy in, in, in churches around our country lately because he knows that if he can get a Christian in leadership to trip up, others are going to follow. And that's why the, the requirements of elders focus us so much on, on the character and the faith of a person, not just how smart they are or how, many, how much knowledge they have of the Bible, but it's what's the character of the, of the, of the leaders. Hebrews 13, 17 says this. And this is also quite sobering for us. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you and consider the outcome of their, of their faith. So there, there's, there's a lot of responsibility for people who would lead the church, for elders, for pastors. It says they must keep watch over you as men who must give an account. And so, so, so we are sort of stewards of the church for a time, but we're going to have to give an account of how, we, of how we led the church, of how we stewarded the church, of, of how we were able to, uh, to be the people and the, and the men that God wants us to be. So because of that, because of that, we, we really need to be praying for elders, for ministers, for all of our staff as leaders again. If Satan can get a leader to, to mess up, it's going to really do a lot of damage in the church as it has in, in, in so many churches in our, in our country in the last several years. They keep watch over you. As many must give an account. So Hebrews 10.25 says, let us encourage one another. We ought to encourage each other, all of us. But listen, especially, especially the elders. And I'm just going to tell you right now that being an elder of the church, as I'm sure Jay and Steve and Monty and I don't know if Rick's here, but would attest that it's, it's almost always a thankless job. Like you, you have no idea 
how much time these guys spend in meetings and and um, I mean, just putting up with me is, is will wear on a person enough. But I mean, meetings, and it's almost always like when things, when decisions are made that people don't like, it's almost always more critical sometimes. And it's just, it can be kind of a thankless job. And so um, just pray for the elders, uh, encourage them. Uh, that's the best thing, best thing you can do. And two times. Two times the Apostle Paul tells Timothy to guard the gospel entrusted to him. First Timothy 6.20, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Second Timothy 1.13, you heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Jesus Christ. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. But the bottom line is that, that the gospel is entrusted to churches and it's up to the leaders of those churches to make sure that, that we stay true to what that gospel is. And, and um, because it, we, it's been entrusted to us. Um, you know, I, I, I read those verses and I couldn't help many years ago. Um, I don't know why. I just, I think I had talked to somebody that had just been there, but... I had this, this image in my mind reading those passages from, from Paul to Timothy about, about the, the tomb of the unknown, unknown soldier. And um, went on to, to read a little bit about it. I've never, I, I've been to Washington, but I don't think I've ever been to that. But, but you might know that one of the highest honors in the military is to guard the tomb of the unknown soldier. I think they just call it the tomb of the unknowns now. But if you've ever been to Arlington Cemetery, you've seen how seriously each one of these guards, these sentinels, um, how seriously they, they, they take their, their job. They call, it, they call it walking the mat. Each soldier, each soldier shows a solemn respect for those who have given their lives to protect America's freedom. That tomb has been guarded continuously since 1930. They guard it in good weather. They guard it in bad weather. It gets cold, it gets hot, but these sentinels, these guards, they never budge. They don't allow feelings of, of cold or heat to be seen by anybody. They don't show reactions about how tired they might be. Whatever it might be, they, they, they do their duty. Now, I was reading that there is an emergency contingency plan in case of severe weather. That soldiers in severe weather, very severe weather, are given the permission to retreat to a certain room during like deadly storms, lightning storms, whatever it might be, that they have permission to do that. But they've never done that. The night of September 18th, for example, 2003, uh, Hurricane Isabel pounded the capital city, but the soldiers continued to walk the mat in front of that tomb of the unknowns, just as they had done every minute of every hour of every day for so many, so many years. The one individual who was on duty that day was Sergeant First Class Frederick Gary. And as he was, he was walking the mat, he heard a sharp cracking sound, but he didn't flinch as a tree came crashing down right where he stood just a few feet away from him. Even though he had permission to, to go to retreat, he wouldn't do it. He said, unless it was something earth-shattering, we have no intention of doing anything other than our duty. He said, this is our highest honor. And I, like I, that's awesome. And I'm not diminishing that at all. But I think there's another tomb that's a little bit more important than that. And we, like we do know, we do know who was in that tomb. And the elders of this church have been entrusted with the highest honor imaginable, guarding the gospel of Jesus Christ and his church. And elders stand, sent, sent, stand sentinel outside an empty tomb that for 2,000 years has been a symbol of the gospel, Jesus Christ, who conquered the grave, who conquered death. And it's the message of the good news of Christ that is more valuable than anything else because it saves people from their sins. It gives us the hope and the promise of eternal life. And the, the elders of the church are called to stand guard and protect this message, protect this gospel so that it doesn't get distorted, it doesn't get confused, but we are crystal clear on what the gospel is. Paul, the apostle Paul at one point warned them. He said, 
He said, woe to you if you ever preach a gospel other than the one that I gave to you. And that's the gospel of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Paul urged Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Guard the good deposit entrusted to you with the help of the Holy Spirit. And so that's what really every Christian ought to strive to do. To make sure that we are guarding and living, watching our life, watching our doctrine closely. So that others might know that God is real. That Jesus Christ is real. That, that he loves us and he gave his life for us to die for us on the cross so that we might have eternal life. And we need to make sure that we, that we are crystal clear on what that, what that gospel is. Just a little bit about the sort of where we come from as a group of churches. Um, again, I would encourage you to, to take a look at that if you're more interested in that. Just want you to know that from the very beginning, our fellowship of churches um, has, stro- has striven to do things exactly uh, as, po- as much as possible by what the New Testament says. Um, That is our goal. That is our desire. And um, even though we are far from perfect at it, um, that is is what our goal is. And so um, hopefully uh, that is something that you want as well, to be part of a church family that simply tries to do things according to how they did it at the first church in in the book of Acts.